Welcome to a special episode of Speed Loads. Uh, for this episode, where we're going is down to Fort Bragg to film and observe the USASOC Sniper Competition. So USASOC stands for United States Army Special Operations Command. And you know, and it'd be easy to think, all right, well that's the Army Special Operations Sniper Match. No, it is the Special Operations Sniper Match that's held annually. Um, so anybody who's Everybody who's anybody is at that sniper match. So you've got each of the special forces groups. So the Green Berets, for the record, special forces means Army Green Berets. There's only one special forces. There are a lot of special operations forces. So every special forces group is there. So first, third, fifth, seventh, 10th, 19th, and 20th. Um, there's a tier one uh, USASOC headquarters team that usually participates. They were there this year. You can't film them though. Um, there was the Marine Corps, uh, the Marine Raiders, so MARSOC was there. There was the Marine Corps Sniper Schoolhouse was there. Um, there was also, you know, normally there's a pretty good contingent of federal law enforcement this year. The only ones that attended were the Secret Service. Uh, the RONA is still out there and still being a pain. There are also uh, international partners that participate. Uh, this year only the French commandos came. Uh, the Dutch sent a observer just so they, to say in person, our team will be here next year when travel restrictions ease up. So it really is kind of a who's who in the special operations community is at this match. It lasts four days um, and, there, and then there are night events on two of the nights. So it's, it's kind of a grind um, and it's comprehensive. And so, um, you know, getting this kind of exposure is, is unusual. Um, but, you know, we're certainly not the, the only ones that have been down there to film. I mean, Fox News has been down there once or twice for like an afternoon to just kind of get some B-roll and talk about it on the news. Um, various publications have been out there to cover it. Uh, but to, to my knowledge, this is the first time that anyone with a sniper background has gone and filmed the match in its entirety and then allowed someone to made that footage available to the public. Um, and so without going any further, first I'd like to thank Night Force and Accuracy International for sponsoring this video. Uh, they're the, the two companies that made it possible for me to go down there and spend all week um, hustling with a camera and then a lot of time in the studio editing the footage together for what you're about to watch. Um, so special thanks to them. So without further ado, let's jump to that first stage. All right, so this is the ELR event or extreme long range. Um, here at Fort Bragg, and uh, the event itself is pretty straightforward. You've got uh, two competitors, each with their sniper rifles. Uh, on the command of go, they'll go up the hill, uh, get in the prone position. Uh, they each have 10 rounds to engage. Uh, there's a whole gang of targets, right? The targets start at 800 meters and go out to one mile. And, um, you know, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's important to remember uh, this is a 308 only match. So 308 bullets get, get blown around a lot. It's not like you're shooting one of the hot sixes or six fives that everybody loves these days. Um, and then, you know, the competitors can work together however they want. They can both stay on the rifles and spot that way. They can put one guy on the glass, have spot, try to get a good wind call. Uh, wind calling out here is gonna be the name of the game. Um, the winds are switching, and I don't know if the audio is gonna pick it up, but it is pretty windy. So, uh, straightforward event, but it's uh, it's a long poke for a 308, and, uh, and that's the extreme long range here at the uh, USASOC Sniper Comp. All right, so this event is called Shoot and Rotate. Uh, and what happens is, you know, each two-man team is gonna have one sniper rifle, one carbine, and then each man will have a pistol. Each man will have five rounds for his pistol. Uh, the carbine shooter will have five rounds for his carbine. Sniper rifle will have five rounds for the sniper rifle. Uh, on the command of go, the first guy uh, is the carbine shooter. He can step forward. You'll see some lines. We've got red and blue lines. Red on the outside, blue on the inside. So carbine shooter's on the red line. He has to at least step forward onto the gravel. He can shoot once he's standing on the gravel, but he does have to stay standing. Um, or you can run down, support off the barricade, and shoot the target that's about the 100-yard line. And, and this is the target that you're going to be shooting. So anything inside the five is going to get you one point. If it's touching the white, it's three. If it's touching the yellow, you're going to get, or the orange, I guess, you're going to get five. So you're going to fire um, carbine shooter, runs out, fires one round, has to come back. As soon as he gets back behind his line, the pistol shooter, same deal, right? He can take one step out on the gravel and let her rip, tater chip, or he can hustle on down and get as close to steel. Uh, they've got a line up there. He can run all the way up, fires one round at the steel, and then the pistol shooter has to come back. Once he crosses his line, carbine shooter's back. 
They keep going until they've each fired five rounds, and then the carbine shooter moves to the pistol shooting station, the pistol shooter moves to the sniper rifle, and, and once again, we just start that rotation. Uh, the sniper rifle, you'd think, hey man, just get forward on the gravel and land the prone, but the rule is once you hit the gravel, you have to be standing. The only thing you support on is that barricade down there, so that's why you'll see them hustle down to the barricade, try to get a nice shot and get all five points instead of you know, one or three or none. Um, so anyway, that's it's a lot of hustling. You know, you think, what well, sniper comp, why is that? Well, you know, snipers are a battlefield in implement, they're a maneuver element. Uh, they'll move in a two-man team. Um, it's not unusual, one to have a sniper rifle, one to have a carbine, both to have pistols. So this is a whole lot of movement and then some very accurate shooting. Uh, just kind of a cool stage, mixing all those weapons uh, together in one place. All right, so this stage is called Spot Your Splash, which is a little bit deceiving because what's really gonna happen is as soon as the guys get here, they offload all their ammunition and they load up with 12 rounds each. You got a carbine shooter, you got a sniper rifle shooter. Uh, ready, set, go. They come up on the line, get in the prone and start engaging targets. Target array runs anywhere from 250 out to about 800. Um, but they've got ammunition. They don't know where it's zeroed. They don't know its trajectory. They don't know anything about it. So. Um, this is kind of problem solving on the clock and it's all about getting that second shot correction. Having good shooting fundamentals, being able to spot your trace or spot impact of the round, call correction off of that. And of course, just good old fashioned problem solving. You know, you can, there's a target board at 24 meters. If you want to try to re-zero off that, I don't know why you would. Um, you can certainly try. Or maybe you pick a piece of steel further out where you've got good background and you know if you send one in that general direction, you're going to be able to see where it lands. That seems to me that I could be, I could be a pretty good strategy. But then again, I'm not shooting it on the clock. So tough stage. Once again, it's all about spotting that impact and correcting off of it. All right. So this stage is called Man Down, and uh, and the reason why it's called Man Down is there's a 175 pound dummy that's up where they up here where they're shooting that they've got to get back to the start point before the five minute stage time is up. So. They're back at the start point. Between the two shooters, they've got 100 rounds of ammunition. You've got your carbine shooter with 40 rounds in his carbine, 15 rounds in his pistol. You got the sniper with 30 rounds for his sniper rifle, 15 rounds for his pistol. Ready, set, go. Up the road they come, get into positions. Um, and man, there is steel everywhere. Um, they've got 100 rounds. There's 100 targets for them to shoot at. Um, there's pistol steel that's up close to the shooting position, a little, little further out. There's uh, carbine steel, and then a little further out after that, there's steel targets, and there's movers for the sniper. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of strategy involved in this one. You've got two shooters, plenty of ammunition, uh, but don't forget the 175 pound dummy needs to be back at the start point before the five minutes is up. So, you know, everybody approaches it a little bit differently. Uh, be forewarned, um, do not be alarmed with some of the dummy dragging techniques. Um, you know, it's not a person, it's a dummy. So if you see it getting drugged by its head, it's just, it's just a dummy full of sand. It's a big sandbag, that's all it is. Uh, really cool stage because there are so many different potential solutions, right? I mean, you could have both guys shooting forever and then at a certain time limit, they pick the dummy up and run. You can come up here, both guys shoot for a while and then one guy starts dragging while the other guy continues to burn it down. Um, it's really kind of up to the team on the clock to come up with their own strategy and that's in keeping with a lot of the competition. Um, these shooters aren't given a lot of information before they shoot um, and they're not given a lot of time to prepare. So it's just really interesting, you know, what one team does can be completely different than what another team might try. So really cool stage, but definitely a lot going on. All right, so uh, this stage is called the Zero Challenge. Um, and it sounds pretty simple. Uh, you've got one guy with a sniper rifle, you've got one guy with the carbine, they get their brief, ready, set, go. They come through the gate here, they take up a prone position on the pad here, and then, uh, and then they start shooting. And they, the carbine shooter, his target is a little bit short of 100 yards. The, uh, the sniper, his target is a little bit past 100 yards. But the catch is, here's their target. Right, so whoever shot this did actually didn't have a, a bad time. Um, you look at these bigger shapes, you'll see, you know, they're minute, minute and a half, but I mean, that thing's about a third of an MOA. And the way it works is they will score two shots per target array. So you can shoot at this thing a half a dozen times if you want. They're going to take your two best hits. But the catch is uh, each shooter only has 10 rounds. So it's kind of in your best interest to put two rounds per target 
and then you get what you get. Um, hitting the big ones, you know, a little bit of a challenge, but not too bad, especially that you can see there's some phenomenal groups with this one. Um, but what's hard is if you want to go for the, the big points, because now you've got these little tiny targets and it's, they're, they're really hard to hit. Um, and you know, if you're not really spun up on how to zero your rifle and the fact that you just don't go to the range and zero your rifle, when you do that, you've zeroed your rifle for that lighting condition. So you've got to understand how lighting conditions can impact zero. And then you also need to understand parallax and how to remove all of that from your weapon before you fire it. Um, because it's pretty easy with just a small parallax error to have, you know, your point of impact shift around by quarter of an inch, half inch. You know, if you got big problems, maybe three quarters of an inch or even an inch, you know, I mean, anything's possible. So uh, pretty straightforward event but harder than it first might appear. All right, so this is called Max Ord or uh, Maximum Ordnance. And uh, what makes this stage so difficult is that the guy firing the rifle can't see the targets that he's supposed to hit. So how's that work? Well, each guy gets six rounds um, and then there's three targets downrange. Um, and then they leave the shooter's box, move up, spotter stays on the high ground, sniper moves down into one of two firing positions. He can get two hits from one position and then he's got to move to the, to the second position for his third hit. Uh, and it's all about the spotter, man. On this one, you've got to have really good communication between the two. And, uh, you know, normally when there's a shooting event, everybody gets focused on the guy with the rifle and what he's doing, but this one's all about the man on the glass. Uh, and what he's got to do is, you know, the two of them have to communicate very well. So they've got to find a point that the sniper can see. And then from that point, the spotter gives the sniper his correction. And, um, and so, you know, the sniper's got to be, the guy on the gun's got to be, you know, good solid shooting fundamentals and excellent communication with the spotter. The spotter has to have that same excellent communication, but then he's got to understand that he's the key to the problem and what he needs to do to solve that problem. And, uh, and then, you know, wind reading skills, like of all the stages that the guys have shot at this sniper competition, I think this one so far anyway, by far has been the most technical, just because it requires so many skills from both of them and such close teamwork that uh, it's, just, it's just a tough stage to get through. All right, so this stage is called Shoot Faster. Uh, it's a combined, you got five minutes, uh, but the way your time is allotted makes this one really difficult. So the guys will start up the road, ready, set, go. They run up the road, get into position. Most guys wind up in these two positions right around here. And then you've got four minutes and 45 seconds to find your targets, to find about eight pieces of steel. And it sounds really easy, right? Um, but the instructors out here, what they've done is they put the eight pieces of steel where targets would normally hide in a combat zone. So they're not standing out in the open waiting to get shot like that never happens maybe on the initial push into iraq or afghanistan that was going on but people learn real quick that's unhealthy so they've got the steel hidden in shadows it's not painted so it blends in with the with the background um you know back in the tree line and it's it is really tough to find those those pieces of steel so you've got four minutes and 45 seconds to find them and then when the instructor says engage you've got 15 seconds to shoot so yeah you want to you look until you find them but when he says ready set go like you get out you got to get on that gas quick um, so heavy on the observation but also heavy on shooting be able to shoot accurately shoot quickly um, and be prepared for that 15 minute basically sprint um, take some foresight and it just takes an experienced shooter to to know how to do that and then on a, in addition to that it takes an experienced shooter to know where where targets are going to hide in a combat zone. So the instructors out here have plenty of experience. Hopefully the, the competitor does too. All right, so this stage, I got to give you the briefing in the studio because when it was out there, it was dark and it wasn't really the time for me to start doing the talking head thing uh, when guys are out there competing. So this was uh, one of the nighttime stages and, uh, and the way it worked is the two guys came down, started in the corner, um, each man had two pistol magazines, six rounds in each mag. The carbine shooter had two carbine magazines, six rounds in each mag. The guy on the sniper rifle, two mags, six rounds per mag. Ready, set, go. One guy runs to the end. They both start on the pistol stages, right? So 
This is at nighttime. You'll see some guys use their head mounted night vision, um, looking through red dot sight, obviously at the night vision setting, working the plate rack in a Texas star. Um, you can do three shots off of one side of the obstacle, and then you have to move and transition to the other side of the obstacle, which on a pistol, no big deal, but on a carbine, now we're shooting, forcing the guy to alternate from strong side to weak side. Same goes on the sniper rifle. So they run down to the ends. Each guy fires three rounds, moves to the other side of the obstacle, fires three rounds. One guy transitions to his carbine. Next guy transitions to the sniper rifle. They move to the next obstacle. Three rounds off of one, three rounds off another, reload, and then they're going to cross somewhere theoretically in the middle. And then the sniper rifle just keeps working his way down. You know, targets for carbine and sniper rifle are between one and 400. And really what this stage is designed to do is it's getting you shooting two guns at night. So either pistol carbine or pistol sniper rifle. Um, and you're also using, you know, a couple of different night vision systems. You've probably got head mounted for your pistol shooting. Although one guy was like, hey, I'm going to white light it because no one said I couldn't. So good for that, dude. You got that nice surefire weapon mounted light. You might as well put it to good use. Um, but you've got head mounted night vision and then you've got night vision or, and or thermal um, mounted on the rifle. So what I liked about this stage is it gets guys using all of the things, right? All of their gear. Uh, you've got mag changes, you've got strong side versus support side. You've got a couple of different weapons you're required to fire. You're doing mag changes. And of course, once again, you're doing it all with a real limited amount of time. So tough stage, but that was, uh, that was one of the night stages. All right, so I'm here with, uh, with Major General Roberson. He is the commanding general of the Special Warfare Center and School, commonly known as SWIC. Yes. Um, sir, wh what does SWIC do? Uh, SWIC has really a couple of different roles, but the, the role that's more important, I think, to what we're talking about here is we train basic uh, Army Special Operations uh, soldiers, whether it's Special Forces, Civil Affairs, or PSYOP. That's one uh, role, the basic okay. pipeline. The, uh, the other role is we do the advanced skills training for all of Army SOF and some other uh, elements of SOF also. And okay. this competition is a, is a part of that because we do a lot of our sniper training. Out right. Here. So uh, some of the advanced skills just for, for the viewer would be yep. uh, sniping, CQB, uh, military free fall, I think scuba school. Scuba, yep. Those are all advanced sure. skills. Sure, sure. And there's a few others. Uh, if you think about it, there's an intellectual side to what we're doing. Sure. So all the all the psychological operations piece. There's a uh, there's some cyber stuff that we do. Yep. Okay. Kind of thing. Yep. Awesome. Um, mm -hmm. You have a reputation as a, as a fighting general, right? I mean, you were you were a junior officer when the war on terror started, uh, and you've seen the whole the whole shooting match, right? I mean, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. Um, what role did snipers play in that conflict, and what role do you see them moving to in the future? Well, I have seen a lot of that. I've seen the evolution. I think that uh, I've had the opportunity to lead um, a lot of our forces, both in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. I've got to see some different ways that uh, uh, sniping has been employed, and it's been important for everything that we're doing. And I, first of all, I'd say, our guys have to be very good at the basics of, of sniping if we're going there, both for our, our individual teams and how we function on a team. Uh, but the other piece is when we're going to these other places, we're usually working with a partner of some type. Gotcha. Uh, and we have to be able to teach them uh, some of the skills that, that we're doing too. So to teach uh, at a high level, you have to be an expert. And I think um, technology has evolved, you know, from, right. the, from the time when all this started. I think we have gotten a lot better with our ability to train ourselves with our ability to use technology to our advantage in sniping and in our ability to uh, to teach our partners and employ them on a battlefield um, at, at any any battlefield awesome mm -hmm. all right so um, what you know what kind of training value would you attach to a, a competition like this one well I think uh, what we do is all about competition. We wouldn't right. be here if we weren't competitive people. And I think when you're competing, that's what brings out the best in people. It brings out the best tactics, techniques, and procedures. So one right. thing that we're seeing, hey, this is the latest and greatest that people are, are using, whether it's techniques, the technology, uh, it's always good just for morale to say who's going to win. This drives us right. to be better. And we're all about constant improvement. We're all about being better, uh, being the best, if that's possible. That's what we're, we're shooting for. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so competition, yep. the, the training value that comes from getting everybody together and getting best practices, you know, there's it's not just the army that's here. There's I've noticed there's a lot of elements from, you know, there's a lot of joint forces, there's, there's law enforcement here. Um, how has that helped the sniping community and SWIC work together with other organizations, maybe outside of SWIC and outside of the army? Sure, I think uh, there's a community of sniping out there. Um, as you said, the interagency is part of it, law enforcement is part of it, the military is part of it. Uh, we want to see what everybody else is doing, how they're competing. We want to make everybody better. We have some international competitors here uh, also. So it's good for us to see that. It's good for us to compete. It's good for us to exchange in a network sense. If we ever need to call on you or work with you in the future, it's good to know you. So I know your organization. I've worked with you in the past. Uh, all, for all of those reasons, it's, it's good to do this, particularly for the interoperability. If we ever had to work with any of these people in the future, we can say, okay, those guys are really good at this. And, and I'm gonna, I'll say something else. A lot of these people have different ideas on how to employ snipers. Uh, for law enforcement, it could be different. We're using some of our, our Army or soft techniques where we're you know, doing some cardio kind of stuff. We're getting guys really, it's not just sitting in a height. You're side, huffing and puffing, around. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're moving people around the battlefield. It's, hey, you're not going to get a whole lot of time to see, you know, the, the chess board before you have to come up and take a shot. Right. Uh, so we're, we're testing some different things to see, hey, who's good at this and who's not good at this. Okay. All right, sir. Well, hey, thank you for your time. I know you're you a bet. busy man. I really appreciate you coming out and just giving us a little bit of, of uh, some insight on what the commander sees of the sniping community and, and SWIC in general. Absolutely, thank you very much, I appreciate it. All right, so this stage is called heavy drop. Um, this one requires a lot of time management and physical fitness. It starts off with uh, each man grounds their rifles at the base of the tower, and then they go to the start point. They Each one, well, one or both, picks up a dummy that weighs 130 pounds, and, and ready, set, go you start running. Every cone you pass is a round. So, you know, you want to run past all 10 cones. One man, that's 10 rounds. Both guys do it. You get 20 rounds. He's so strong. Um, at any point, you can drop the dummies and then it's time to run up the tower. You come up to the fourth floor, uh, which is where I'm at right now, and then uh, get the good prone shooting position and you can run spotter shooter or shooter shooter you can do it however you want uh, but you only get the number of rounds of cones that you passed you've got four minutes to do this whole thing so the time goes really quickly uh, and then once you get into shooting position uh, your targets start at 550 meters and go all the way out to a thousand so um, really this is a, this is a thinking man's game it sounds pretty simple but you got to have a good strategy good time management to make the most uh, out of those rounds that you get. Um, I don't personally think anybody's gonna come close to firing 20 rounds. So me, I'm a little bit lazy. I don't think I'd carry that dummy very far. So anyway, really cool stage, but once again, just illustrates the good balance you gotta have as a special operations sniper against uh, strategery, physical fitness, and shooting ability. All right, so this stage is called Disable and Destroy. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, each competitor gets 10 rounds and, uh, and they've got six minutes to solve the problem. So ready, set, go, they move up on the line. There's two separate shooter's boxes that split them apart by, you know, let's call it about 15, 20 feet. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, once each position, each shooter is in position, then there's eight targets out there anywhere from 500 to 750 meters. It's uh, torso targets and, uh, and IP6. And uh, it's called disable and destroy because the one shooter has to hit the target that gets you 25% of that target's points. It's not until the second shooter hits the same target that you get the full point value. And, uh, and there's a couple reasons why they do it that way. One, you know, snipers work as teams and they've got to get those two guys talking together and being able to hit the same targets. Um, but they split them apart to make it a little harder. Normally snipers would shoot right next to each other so that you can watch the other guys trace. And uh, if you know his wind hold and you see traces, you know, the bullet disturbs the air as it flies. So you can watch where that bullet flies and correct off of that. There's no need to talk. You can just make the adjustment and shoot. Um, but once you get split apart, then now instead of watching the trace go straight to the target, it comes in from the side. Um, so it just, it makes it, it just makes it hard. And uh, so pretty technical stage. Um, like I said, you don't get full points value till both shooters hit the same target. And uh, if you get four of the eight targets, you're probably doing pretty good. All right, so this stage is called Fundamentals and Murphy. 
And uh, so no big surprises there, fundamentals. That means no electronics are allowed to be used on the stage. Uh, you've got two shooters, you've got a sniper, and you've got uh, the carbine shooter. Uh, you can both stay on glass if you want. You can have one guy functioning as a spotter. How, typical of the stages, you solve the problem however you want. But uh, each man has seven rounds. Uh, each man has three targets. You've got uh, six minutes total. Your sniper, his targets run from 700 to 900 meters. Your carbine shooter, his targets run from 400 to 600 meters. And uh, and ready, set, go. And so, you know, you've got to, you won't see, normally when you hear, you know, no electronics, obviously that means you have to mill the target size and then from there, uh, you have to know the size of the target, but if you know the size of the target and you mill it correctly, uh, you can do some quick math and figure out the range to that target in either meters or yards, depending on the formula you use. Uh, you won't see calculators and, and pads out here because a lot of guys, I think, are smart enough to know, hey, as soon as you hear fundamentals, assume that you're not going to be allowed to use any gear at all. And, uh, and so I think on their risk coaches, a lot of them have just prepared um, not a range card because no one knows the distances to the target, but like a dope card. Like, hey, if it mills, if, I, if it's an IPSC and it mills this much, I look at my card and I know, okay, that's X amount of yards away and I can go ahead and get on the gas and send it. So um, definitely harder, but with a little bit of prep, you can streamline that process. So you're not, like I said, you're not out there with a calculator, pad and paper on the clock because um, that would be kind of a train wreck. So most guys you know, don't run out of time. It's just identifying the target and getting rounds on target because it's not a super far distance, but there's some wind. It's just, it's just a hard stage. All right, so this stage is called Choose Your Color. And the way it works is uh, each man loads up 10 rounds for handgun, 10 rounds for carbine, moves to their shooting position. And then uh, when the instructor says go, they've got three minutes. First thing they're gonna do is pick their color, right? Yellow, draw their pistol, shoot the uh, yellow plate on the plate rack, either holster or set the pistol down, go to their carbine and transition to the yellow plate on the Texas Star. The Texas Star is about 100 yards, the plate rack's about, I'm guessing 20, 25 maybe, um, and they've got three minutes to do that. Uh, there's a, a point multiplier at 200 and another one at 300. And what that is is a full size IPSC with a center plate. If you hit that center plate uh, the, at 200, you get a 50% point bonus. If you hit the, the center plate at 300, you'll get a 100% point bonus, but it's kind of a trap. They've had two guys clean the stage, get 50 points, and then uh, try to hit the multiplier and hit the impact, hit the, the, the uh, IPSC, not the chest plate. So anywhere other than that chest plate, it zeroed out their points. So yes, this is a sniper competition. No, there are no sniper rifles at this stage. But it just kind of drives home the point that special operations snipers, you know, they're going to be issued at least one sniper rifle, at least one carbine, and at least one pistol. And they're going to be expected to be proficient with all three of those firearms. So this is the, uh, the second night stage. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, both shooters are uh, carrying sniper rifles. When they say ready, set, go, guys move up to a vehicle. Usually one guy's on the hood, one guy's on the trunk and you're shooting targets from 100 to 400 meters. Um, the targets they're shooting are going to be snaps and movers, right? So snaps are just targets that come up for a few seconds and then go back down. So you got to be quick. You got to get on them quick, know your dope, uh, and then send one quickly. Uh, and then movers, you're shooting at about a 12 inch wide piece of cardboard that's on a track. And, um, you know, either you hit it or you don't. Um, that once again, I think those things popped up, moved for a while, and I think they just moved until they were hit. Uh, in some of the video, you can actually see those things get hit and lay down. Um, so this is a, you know, a, a pretty, once again, straightforward stage that shouldn't seem that bad, but you've got to, you'll notice like some of the night vision setups on these rifles are, are pretty prodigious, and uh, you've got to know how to get those things set up and get the most out of them. Um, you know, for you camera nerds that are watching, this was filmed at 9 o'clock at night with very little ambient light. Uh, it was a Sony A7S III on a 24mm 1.4 GM lens. And, uh, man, if you got to film at night, that is, that is the way to do it. So, anyway, that was the second night stage. All right, so this is the stalking stage. Um, pretty typical sniper fare, right? you got to stalk into position, and in this case, you've got to be able to observe uh, four faces on a piece of paper through a window. 
Uh, the, the time slots are pretty compressed. They've got a 30 minute window to stalk and get into position and then they've got about five minutes to observe. So, uh, and then the windows are facing out. So the, the team's gonna have to split up. One guy will take one window, another guy will take another. And, uh, and then about those four faces, um, three of those are threat targets, one is not. Uh, it sounds pretty simple, just remember the one that isn't and shoot everything else except uh, they were given nine threat faces earlier in the week and now they have to remember which three are theirs. That'll come into play at a later stage. So, and also because it is a compressed time window, you're gonna see more like leafy suits and just like a light ghillie. You're not gonna see the real elaborate ghillies with lots of vegetation um, because of the compressed timeline. 30 minutes to do a stalk is, is really fast. So the guys have to kind of configure um, their equipment for the mission they're given. If it was like, hey, you got half a day, then you would see the big ghillies that people would kind of expect with snipers with all the veg stuck on them. So uh, cool phase, and then they'll take the information they acquire from this one and, uh, and carry it into the next stage. All right, so this is the threat identification stage. Uh, on the previous stage, the competitors had to stalk into position, uh, observe through two separate windows, and there were three threat faces, three out of the four faces on their piece of paper were threats. Once that stage was over, they move, they come down here, and now they've got uh, a five minute window. Um, is, if they didn't get busted on the stock, they've got three rounds for each guy that didn't get busted. So another guy gets busted stalking, they got six rounds, they've got six targets. Um, but there are eight faces per target board and it's set up just shy of 300 meters. So dope's gotta be on, you know, headshots at 300, a little bit difficult, uh, especially depending on what the wind's doing. Um, but they've got a five minute window, get into position, and the sniper has three shots for his, the carbine shooter has, has three shots for his, um, and uh, it's, it's pretty tight. Uh, there's no guarantee that every face, that you, every threat face that you saw on the previous stage is gonna be on the board. Um, and then there's just gonna be a lot of other boards with a lot of other faces. So it gets really problematic of remembering exactly which face is your threat and then hitting that threat at 300 meters. Uh, the other thing is it's not just a, any hit will do. There's a smaller circle inside the face. If you want to get 100% of your points, you've got to hit inside the smaller circle. Um, so tough stage and uh, you better have a good memory. All right, so this is the first stage of the stress test. It's called pistols only. So what will happen is the competitors we have released at you know an undisclosed point, and they'll have to move on foot rapidly uh, to get to here. Now that they've got 18 minutes for the foot movement, and for this stage and three others, so it's 18 minutes. You're covering a lot of ground. You're slinging a lot of lead, so it, you really have to to move quickly. Um, like I said, this first stage is called pistols only. There are 50 pieces of steel, and each competitor has 30 rounds. So between the two guys on the team, there's 60 rounds. You can drop 10, it's still clean. Um, I don't think anybody's done that yet. Um, you know, a common statement you'll hear is, man, that's, that's a lot of pistol shooting for a sniper competition. And, uh, and that's true. Uh, but you gotta keep in mind, special operations snipers are often tasked uh, with building climbing, which means, you know, in urban environments, it's easier to go up the outside of the building than it is to work your way through the inside. So they'll move up on the outside of the building and, um, and you wanna do that with pistols drawn, right? You can't really move climb with, with a rifle in your hands. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, you might have to make entry sometimes into a structure and, you know, do you want to do that with a bolt action 300 Norma or do, would you rather do that with a, a 9 millimeter pistol? Neither one of those is a great choice, but you definitely should take the pistol if you ever find yourself in that situation. Um, and so, you know, you issue the pistol, you will most likely be called on to use it at some point in your military career if you see a lot of combat. And so that's why you see stages like this where there's so much steel and so much pistol work um, at a sniper competition. So this is the first stage of four, and, uh, and man, time is definitely a big issue. All right, so this is the second stage of the stress test, and this is called Hilo Crash Site. So competitors will finish wearing out the pistol steel, and then they got another foot movement, got a huff and puff. Get up here as quickly as you can. They'll move in and they'll set up positions on these rocks right here. And then uh, what'll happen is if you look way out here in the corner, it's kind of hard to see, there's a downed helicopter with a pilot standing next to it. So once they get on the rocks, 
time starts, right? There are lots of music, some flashbangs, things to distract them, and to make communication between the two team members difficult. Uh, and then as soon as the the students or the competitors touch the rocks, you'll, what you'll see is a uh, target down there. Well, you probably won't see it, but it, he'll give it like three or four peaks, and then he's going to wheel uh, and head for the, the helo. Um, these uh, targets are made by Marathon targets, and so they're mobile and they can be programmed to do a whole bunch of things. So the pilot's standing next to the helicopter. Uh, he's got the one guy that was hiding behind the shed will start running for him, and then there's three more that are hidden that will also start converging. And as they converge on that helicopter, um, what will happen is when they get within hand grenade range or seven meters, um, then that pilot's a fatality and he'll, he'll fall over and that stage is over. So guys that take a lot of time getting set up, monkeying with their position, um, you know, they might only be here 20 or 30 seconds because that conversion has happened and by the time they look through the scope, the pilot's already down. Uh, guys that get into position quickly, start laying down some hate, uh, keeping those, those targets away from the pilot usually do pretty well. Um, there's four targets you could hit, no one's got all four yet. Uh, so intricate stage, um, definitely not something you're going to see at a civilian rifle match, uh, but very realistic for the types of events and scenarios that will face a special operations sniper. All right, so this stage is called Get the High Ground. Uh, this is the third event in the stress test. Um, and what happens is once they get here, they uh, get to the tower, they run up to the fourth floor, which is where I'm sitting in the windowsill. They, they, they get in the shooter's box, and then there are six targets that are hidden somewhere out here. And, uh, and so what they've got to do is get on glass. They have to stay in the shooter's box for two minutes. They can shoot all six targets. They can shoot no targets. Um, course they have to find them first so it's it's one of these things where once again we're delineating the difference between uh, you know a precision rifle competition and a sniper competition this is very much a team event so they have to communicate where they're looking you know if they're smart they'll break down their areas scan for targets and then communicate to each other what they found um, if you're struggling or maybe you hate the guy you're competing with and you yell at each other um, or you know it's it's hard to find the targets uh, they're camouflaged and I don't think anybody's found all six I think the most hits we've seen so far on the stage is about, about five. Um, so someone crushed it. But uh, average is probably two or three. So once again, this is all part of your 18 minute event, right? Ready, set, go. You start running, huffing and puffing. You know you're gonna, splant, you're gonna spend at least two minutes sitting here in this windowsill looking for targets and shooting them. Uh, and then you gotta run up to the fourth floor to get here and then you gotta run back down to the ground and move to the next stage. So a little bit brutal. That's why they call it the stress test. All right, this is the last stage of the stress test. So what will happen is competitors will come running up. They'll have to climb up on top of this wood contraption, and then they engage flip-up targets that are out there about 150 meters out. Um, this event is all about how good a shape the, the competitor's in. If you're in excellent physical condition, you'll make it here within the time limit. You'll be able to get up on top, and then you've got nice, easy shots to go ahead and rack up some points, get that little cherry on top. If you're just in good physical condition, there's a decent chance uh, that you're not going to even get here. So it's just was set up to be to delineate those select few who are in excellent condition from those who are just in good condition. And like I said, it's a rough and tough 18 minutes, but this is the end. So what'd you think? There's the whole match. Um, you know, you kind of get the idea that, hey, after four days of this, man, guys are beat down and tired. And I mean, I was out there with a camera and that's all I was carrying just about. And I was exhausted by the end of this thing, too. Um, some of the key differences you'll notice between this match and what you'll see in maybe the precision rifle uh, competition scene as uh, you know, the precision rifle scene is all about rifle shooting. And I would tell any special operations sniper or any law enforcement sniper, if you wanna get better with a rifle, 100% the best way to do it is go compete. You're gonna get a beat down, and, but you'll learn quickly because you'll see the best shooters in the country and how they solve problems. So precision rifle competitions are a very valuable component to any rifleman's you know, repertoire. That, is, that should be considered part of your essential training. However, what this match does that no other match has a chance of doing is it incorporates um, decision making, moving, and communicating into a match. So let's kind of break that down. The moving component's pretty easy, right? I mean, hey, pick up the 130 pound dummy and start running. Or, hey, before you're done shooting, you know, if for this stage to be successful, this 175 pound dummy has to be all the way over there before your time runs out. So there is a physical fitness component in this match that, whoo, um, 
Like you have to be ready for that. But once again, that's kind of what we expect of a special operations sniper. The communications component. Um, you know, you go to a regular match and it's just you just shooting and you know exactly what you're stepping into. This one, it's two guys and if they're smart and working as a team, they communicate back and forth what they're seeing and what they're doing. And in some of these stages, you can't complete it by yourself. You have to be able to, to work as a team and that more accurately affects what life in the combat zone is like. Um, you know, nobody's a one man army. You're gonna be out there with teammates and you have to know how to work with each other to get the most out of the unit. It's not about that any one individual, it's about mission, the, the unit accomplishing the mission. And then the last component, which is personally my favorite, is how they work decision making into this match. If you've ever been to a precision rifle match, you've probably seen someone have a meltdown and throw a little bit of a temper tantrum, um, and that's unfortunate. The guy that does that would, would suck at this match, um, and would also you know, be pretty horrible at war. Like I would highly recommend, like if, if you're a, an emotional machine and you can't handle ambiguity, then, then this is not the job for you. Um, you know, life in a combat zone, your most essential skill is your decision making. Certainly skill at arms comes into play, physical fitness comes into play. Um, you know, there's a lot of technical tasks with which you must be proficient. Everything from, you know, basic trauma um, skills to, you know, how to maintain your communications gear. You know, mission planning is another one that's often overlooked. But above all else, when chaos breaks out, you have to be able to make decisions. And you often have to be able to do that uh, on a very compressed timeline with very little information and oftentimes the information you have is questionable. So if you're going to go all Casper milk toast and like oh geez and start whimpering and wringing your hands and like I don't know what to do, once again you'll fail at this match and you're not a strong candidate for the battlefield. Um, so I love that they've incorporated that ambiguity and that chaos and you know the guys that excel at this match are the ones who can ready, set, go, and immediately start making decisions for better or worse, knowing that the information they have is imperfect, but they're gonna take what they have and run with it, which is why you see one team do one thing on a stage, it's the exact same stage, they got the exact same information, next team comes through and does something completely different. So pretty cool aspect of this match. But anyway, um, you know, I hope you, you enjoyed this look at the special operations community. Um, it's, it's unusual to have this kind of access and to be able to, to dissect it at this level. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Night Force and Accuracy International for making it possible. Um, I'd also like to thank my old friend Scott, who's still serving, who identified this opportunity and, and called me up. Um, you know, it's really, it was that phone call that kind of set everything in motion and made this video possible. So it was great for me to do, it was a lot of fun, um, and I hope that you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed putting it together.